Okay, and Taloa, if you'll give some staff introductions. Hi, so I'm Taloa Berg. I'm a program coordinator with USET. Today we have Imani Ransby, a staff epidemiologist, giving us IHS area updates. Um, Dr. Brown will give us uh, updates about, or laboratory testing about COVID-19. We'll also be hearing from Celeste Davis from Northwest Portland um, and Jorge Mera. So first we'll go to Imani's presentation. Hi, good morning, everyone. As Taloa Berg mentioned, my name is Imani Ramsby, and I'm a staff epidemi epidemiologist with USET. I'm just going to briefly go over the Nashville area COVID-19 epidemiology. We currently have 33 sites that are reporting on COVID-19 testing data at this time. Um, as of now, 2,051 tests have been conducted. Of those, we have 151 positive test results and um, 1,593 negative test results. We will continue to report on um, the IHS area surveillance um, on these weekly echo sessions, so please tune in for that. And with that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Dr. Harry Brown. Actually, we're going to Dr. Mira. Sorry about that. No worries. Okay. There was this weird noise here and I, like a whistle and I was, I didn't know where it was coming from. So I was trying to correct that. Okay. So there's been a lot of uh, new information in the last week and I'll try to cover it briefly as as briefly as I can. So CDC uh, updated the watch for symptoms. So besides fever, shortness of breath and cough, they added chills, repeated shaking with chills, muscle pain, headaches, sore throat, and new loss of taste or smell, which is important because it does affect your screening activities. Uh, for example, at Cherokee Nation, we have someone at the door screening you for, until a few days ago, for fever, shortness of breath or cough, and now we have to add all of these symptoms uh, to see if someone needs to be screened for COVID or not. So this is just an FYI. And on the right hand side, is good information to give patients who test positive and you're sending them home, uh, some warning signs of when they should, you know, go to your emergency department or uh, call 911 if any of these symptoms appear. So a little bit about antibody testing uh, again. So it's very important before we jump into buying any commercial kit for antibody testing to have in your mind, what do you want, what answers, I'm sorry, what questions do you want answered when those tests are resulted? So I divided it into four categories. So if the presence of antibodies to COVID-19 confirms exposure, that is important because it's an epidemiological tool to know what the prevalence of the disease or incidence is, depending on what you're measuring. And also to select patients who are gonna be donors of convalescent plasma or uh, hyperimmune uh, serum preparations. The presence of antibodies, if they confirm immunity, meaning you are measuring neutralizing antibodies, uh, that may mean that that person can return to work and it's not affected by uh, a reinfection. Um, if antibodies can complement RNA testing, uh, COVID-19 RNA testing to confirm early infection, that would also be important because as we know, PCR testing is not 100% sensitive. So if by adding an antibody test, that would help you diagnose that uh, gap of patients that we're not picking up with uh, PCR, that would also be good. And finally, if the titers of the antibodies the, can predict severity of disease, that would also be important uh, for interventions to be made when treatment is available, uh, uh, good treatment is available. 
So having that in mind, the only published study that has been, uh, that's in the literature right now, it's one that comes from China. It's pretty well done. Uh, it's not perfect, but it's uh, the best we have. And it's antibody responses to COVID-19 and to SARS-CoV-2 in patients with um, COVID-19. Uh, COVID so what they did is they sampled 173 patients that had confirmed um, uh, COVID infections defined by respiratory symptoms or abnormal CTs and with a confirmed PCR. And they measured uh, total antibody, uh, AB stands for, I'm sorry, for total antibody, IgM and IgG using an ELISA method. And their essay was very specific because they tested it for previous samples, meaning previous before the pandemic, of samples of patients who had been infected with other coronaviruses, and the test was very specific. So, this is a table with the results, and don't get overwhelmed by the numbers. I'll, I'll, I'll walk you through it, or at least on the important parts. So when you, they looked at sensitivity of total antibody, so AB stands for total antibody, IgM or IgG, uh, total antibody has the best sensitivity, 93%. Now, have in mind that this is across all the time periods. So here they classify the patient samples, serum samples, uh, or plasma samples, I'm sorry, like within one week of infection from eight, day eight to 14, and then from day 15 to 39. So taking all of those results into account, total antibody was the best. But when you look at the first week of infection, the sensitivities are not that great, 38, 28, 19%. So this test clearly will not help you much in picking up an early infection. Now when they added the test, the antibody test to RNA done that week, in their cohort, it improved sensitivity of diagnosis from 66% using RNA to 78% using a combination of RNA and antibody tests. Uh, finally, after the four week, or after the 40 days of evaluation, uh, I mean 40 days since the patients had symptoms evaluation, all the patients, according to their test, was had a total antibodies detectable. So at that moment in time, their test seems to be useful for uh, uh, ruling out patients who were not infected or confirming patients who had the infection. So this, in this slide here, this is just a summary of what I just said. Sensitivity overall of the test is high. Uh, it takes about 11 to 14 days for most of these tests to be positive, but early in the infection, only less than 40% of the tests were positive. Combining RNA and antibody seem to improve a little bit at least uh, uh, the diagnosis of infection in the first week. And another interesting thing they found is the higher titers of antibodies were independently associated with worse clinical uh, outcome, the classification of the patients. So that, uh, that this is what they did. Now remember, this is the ELISA that they designed in their lab you know, for their population. So if we go to our first four premises and classifying in green, it's good, and in red, it's not good, so the presence of antibodies, confirmed exposure at, you know, after 40 days of, of symptom initiation. So it could be good for that. The presence of antibodies did not confirm immunity. They, they did not test for neutralizing antibodies. Antibodies could complement RNA, so it's kind of half and half. That's why I put half green and half red to, for early infection. It does improve early infection diagnosis, but not to a level of 100% or close to that. And in their study, the titers of antibodies predict severity. So they had some good things and some not so good things. Uh, now, this is just an example. You're gonna be offered in the next few weeks or months, a lot of commercial tests that are available. Now, these have been waived by the FDA to be commercialized, but they're not approved by the FDA. So you have to take that into considera consideration. Read the package insert very carefully. If you take this test, for example, and just for bias purposes, I'm not putting the name of the test. The test was, it says the test has not been reviewed by FDA. The results of antibody testing should not be used as a sole basis to diagnose. Negative test results do not rule out SARS-CoV-2. Positive results may be due to past or present infections with other coronaviruses and so on and so forth. So after you read this, you're not very uh, inclined to actually purchase this test. And when you look at their sensitivities of uh, it's you know 66 percent so anyways that's just as an example of look at the pack package insert 
uh, of whatever you're gonna look for and make sure that at least satisfies uh, the answers to the questions that you have or else don't do it. Now the WHO and the IDSA, both spokespersons basically have stated that, you know, this time uh, we don't know if these tests confirm immunity, uh, if they confirm diagnosis, we don't know the accuracy or the reliability, et cetera. So there's no formal recommendation from any society to do antibody testing, which contradicts what you may be hearing in the news that all these states are moving forward with antibody testing. As long as you do it within a research component, that's fine. But I don't think they're, they're, it's not, they're not in their prime time yet to be uh, making any clinical decisions. Okay, the IDSA, switching gears, the IDSA came up with guidelines regarding infection control. So I think on our last meeting, I showed you the guidelines regarding treatment. And all the definitions uh, are based on, dep uh, depending if you and your facility have conventional capacity, meaning you, you have supplies for PPE um, uh, available, or you're in contingency capacity, meaning you have supplies, but you need to conserve them and you need to be uh, careful with the use, or you're in crisis mode, meaning that you have critical supplies lacking. And all of these recommendations are for healthcare personnel caring for patients with suspected COVID or known COVID-19. So this is just a summary slide, and I'll, uh, I, I have some other more detailed slides, but this is the, the one that you need to pay attention to. So everybody needs appropriate PPE, you know, gowns, gloves, and eye protection. If you're in a conventional situation, not in a crisis mode, uh, and there's no aerosols being generated, a surgical mask or N95 or PAPR was fine for IDSA guidelines. And if you are in uh, generating aerosols, you do need an N95 or a PAPR. If you're in contingency settings uh, or crisis mode, without aerosols, you, you still cannot go away without a surgical mask or a reprocess N95. So here's when you can reprocess them. Um, so you, it is not permissible, even if you don't have, don't have enough masks to engage with these patients. And if there is aerosols being generated, uh, they recommend for when you're um, reprocessing or extending the use of, of N95 to use a, a face shield to cover that uh, N95 that's reprocessed or to use a surgical mask covering the N95. So these, I think, are new recommendations based on the, their evaluation of evidence. And I'm not going to go into all the details of these next two slides, but I'll leave them for you for your review. And here are all the recommendations, and you have the strength of the recommendation if it's uh, strong with moderate, certainly of evidence, et cetera. So you can, for yourself, make your own opinion of what you would apply or not. And this is the second part, but all this is summarized on the slide that I gave you above. So the, the bottom line is, you always will need a mask, what, a surgical mask at least to encounter a patient with COVID. But if you're reprocessing or extending the use of masks, you can uh, you need to cover them with a surgical mask or with your face shield. And then uh, two important things is that um, on recommendation three and four, there's not evidence to make any recommendations on double gloving or on shoe covers. Uh, so there, I mean, you can do whatever you want, but there's no, no evidence in favor or against. There's a knowledge gap. Okay, going to uh, another topic. So this is a study that um, uh, was published in MMWR in four cities of the US looking at prevalence of COVID-19 in homeless shelters. And uh, the bottom line is that when a homeless shelter has uh, suffered a cluster of cases, and they tested the the patients and the the people who the homeless people and the staff. There was a high prevalence of COVID. Thirty six percent of residents in Boston, and 37, 37, 30 percent of the staff had COVID nineteen. San Francisco sixty six percent and sixteen, and in Seattle seventeen across the board. Now, when there's no cases or only one isolated case then that goes down to 5% of the residents and 1% of the staff in Seattle and 4% and 2% in Orlando. So the CDC recommends that homeless service providers implement infection control practices, apply social distancing, and promote the use of cloth face coverings. And I think we have to be very diligent, and this is a place that you should be actually doing surveillance um, about COVID-19. The graph on the, the 
chart on the right is just, uh, the table on the right is just the detailed numbers uh, that I summarized on the left. Again, federal prisons, hotspot, only 2% of federal prison populations have been tested and over 70% of those who were tested um, were positive for COVID-19. So that's another place that we need to implement surveillance and all the um, infection control measures uh, to prevent outbreaks. This is, um, this, is not pub this is not a publication. This is uh, the Cherokee Nation Health Services Management of Employee Health Travel. And I'm just bringing this up to uh, stimulate you on what you, you're going to, uh, on thinking of what you're going to do because, you know, the summer's coming and people are going to start uh, having vacation and traveling. And when your healthcare providers travel, when they return, the question is, what are you going to do? And the first thing is uh, we combined uh, some CDC guidelines with, Actually, they're all CDC guidelines, but not all for travel specifically. So the first bullet, international or cruise travel, and bless your heart if you're going to go on a cruise, because good luck with that. But if you decide to do so, you should quarantine these individuals 14 days when they return. That's a CDC recommendation. That's straightforward. Domestic travel, we just adopted the CDC recommendations for personnel that are highly needed that could have been exposed to COVID. And so we are basically screening when they return. If they had a known exposure to COVID or a, a confirmed or possible, we will quarantine them. If they're symptomatic, we just will test them and rule out COVID. But if they're asymptomatic, and in this category would be probably the or most people fit, we will let them work, but they will have to be pre-screened by the employer, meaning temperature measurement and daily symptom monitoring, regular um, uh, um, you use of a surgical mask, social distancing, and disinfection of the cleaner workspaces. And the number of disinfections probably has to be at least twice a day um, based on the Singapore data. So this is just, just our guide. This doesn't have to be your guide, but you'll have to come up with something, and at least this gives you some framework to work with. Um, and this is just uh, my humor comment of the day. So. I was reading the, these articles and they said older adults with COVID-19 uh, have several atypical symptoms, complicating efforts to ensure they get timely and appropriate treatment, according to physicians, whoever they may be. So I'm, I was a little bit surprised that they thought that older people being confused with an infection was an atypical symptom. I mean, that's what we all see with any other infection. And I thought this was, I just thought that these people have never seen an old fellow with an infection. Anyway, um, this is another interesting study about fatty liver, non-alcoholic fatty liver, or metabolic-associated fatty liver. This study found that uh, younger individuals with fatty liver had twofold higher, higher prevalence of severe COVID-19 uh, compared to older individuals with fatty liver in which uh, MAFLD was not associated with the, the increased severity. But this is another factor to have uh, taken into account um, and they did a pretty good uh, adjustment for uh, confounding variables. Like they, um, they adjusted it for age, sex, smoking status, overweight, diabetes, and hypertension. And, they, and it still was significant. This is a report from California, just telling us a little bit more of what we know, but just uh, reaffirming some information. So 1200, almost 1,300 patients who were tested, who tested positive for COVID-19, the most common comorbidity was hypertension, and that, this is panning across the board. 29% uh, had to be admitted, and 29% of those admitted needed to be to the ICU. So you can use the 30% rule, 30% will get admitted, 30% will end up in the ICU, and of uh, those in the ICU, 50% died. Um, when you look at the age distribution, the majority of patients that were admitted either to the general ward or intensive care were within the 50 and 69 year age group. And this is another study in New York, a little bit more patients, 5,700 patients. And then again, the medium age was, was above 60, 63. The most common comorbidities were hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. Uh, interestingly, only 30% of the Patients were febrile on triage. We kind of knew that, but that just confirms that. And 21% of overall of overall of the patients died. They had a very high ICU mortality, 282 of the 320, 
but there could have been some bias in the way they obtained the data. And um, this might not really reflect the, the true mortality, but nevertheless, it's high. So uh, some information on pregnant females. So this is a study from China in which 118 pregnant females with COVID-19 were identified and 92% uh, had mild disease, 8% had severe disease. The symptoms are not very different from non-pregnant females and, um, and also the lab and CT abnormalities are very similar. The important thing is that uh, the, the, this data did not suggest an increased risk of severe disease among pregnant women, at least in this cohort, uh, like we observe with influenza. So that's a little bit more reassuring, although pregnant females should still be considered high risk until we have more data that confirms this. Uh, there are some guidelines out there for breastfeeding uh, issued by CDC. Um, so there's limited data on whether SARS-CoV-2 can be transmitted through breast milk and mothers with suspected or confirmed COVID-19 should take precautions when breastfeeding, basically wash their hands, wear a cloth face covering, and also breast fed infants of infected mothers should be considered as having suspected COVID-19 for the duration of the mother's uh, recommended period of isolation and 14 days after. So we apply the same uh, infection control measures uh, that we do for uh, infected individuals. Okay, in this table, I've summarized the three studies that have looked at um, uh, if taking ACE inhibitors or uh, ARVs are safe uh, in patients who have COVID-19. So the first um, two studies are in China, the third is in the UK. Um, the first study, uh, only a single center, uh, the second a multi-center, and third there were two centers. You can see the number of patients included in each study. The first two studies, the patients were taking ACE inhibitors or ACE receptor blockers. And the first study did not find any difference in mortality. The second study did find that patients who were on ACE inhibitors and ARBs at lower mortality, 3.7% compared to 9.8, and they did adjust for co-founders, and, um, and it was statistically significant. And the third study only looked at um, ACE inhibitors uh, because ARBs, I mean, the very few patients were on, on ARBs. That's a typo here on the slide, I have to correct that. And they did, they did find that patients on ACE had lower mortality, 14% versus 29%, and it also was statistically significant. So apparently, do not take your patients off these medications if they get COVID-19, because the data so far supports that they uh, do better than if they don't take them, but we'll have to see more detailed studies in the future when they show. And finally, I want to mention briefly the remdesivir trial. So there's some new information. In my opinion, a little bit disturbing. I'll tell you why. So in this study, in which FDA plans to authorize emergency use of the drug, the patients were received from uh, remdesivir. So this was a randomized uh, placebo-controlled study, and 31% of the patients um, Im improved. The ones who were receiving the antiviral, remdesivir, had a faster clinical recovery, 11 days versus 15 days, but mortality rate was not statistically significant. So, you know, what we really want in these drugs is if they can decrease mortality. Uh, of course, it is desirable if you have, le you know, less days of fevers or, or cough or whatever, but at the end of the day, we want a drug that has an impact on outcomes and not only on symptoms. In my opinion, so far, this is just a Tylenol on steroids. It, you'll feel better quicker and that's fine, but, I don't think this is the, the goal of, uh, of treatment. And the problem if the FDA authorizes this is that we're gonna be obligated to give it to everybody because it's gonna be standard of care and God only knows how much this is gonna cost and if the government's gonna pay for it or not. So these are questions and that don't have an answer yet. There's another study of remdesivir, Chinese study published in Lancet and they did not find any, um, any benefits of, um, of this drug uh, clinically uh, cl regarding um, symptoms or mortality. Um, and, and there might be a, a mild improvement in, in symptoms, but it was not statistically significant. So again, I think this is controversial. Um, there was a study by Gilead, not peer reviewed yet, 
in which giving remdesivir five days versus 10 days was apparently the same, no, no difference. And finally, you all heard about the unfortunate uh, healthcare provider who committed suicide in New York. I don't know the details. The suicide was related to anything re directly related to the COVID-19 epidemic or not, but this article by uh, Walton and Murray um, reviews the topic and you know, medical staff and affiliated healthcare workers are under both physical and psychological pressure. And the paper gives you uh, some ideas of interventions uh, in your organization and teams uh, to support the, the to support them during the pandemic, and I think it's it's worth uh, a review. And that is all I have. Thank you. We had one question for you, Dr. Mira. Um, any update on the vaccine front? Vaccine? Yes. Okay, so. What I've heard is more uh, on um, what I've seen in the news than what I've read published. Uh, okay, well, let me tell you what the, the published papers that I've read, um, there was one vaccine in clinical trials, phase one clinical trials. They were optimistic about it. Um, and they were saying that it still would take 12 to 18 months to know if the vaccine would work and if it was safe. Now on the news, you've been hearing that by January, we're gonna have a vaccine, and, but I, I don't know, I don't have any data of how true that is or, or, or is not, I, I don't know. I think there's gonna be considerable progress based on the review I read and the published, I believe it was in Lancet. I mean, things are gonna go faster than they've done in the past, but still, you know, you're, the fastest vaccine approved so far took four years until it got from day one until approval. But after approval, you have, uh, to produce the vaccine for everybody. And then you have to implement vaccination. So from what I've read so far, I don't think we'll have a vaccine that me and you can access in at least two years. Uh, but I hope I'm wrong and we, you know, maybe we can get it sooner. Thank you. Uh, now we'll move on to Celeste Davis and she'll be presenting on reopening considerations. Okay, um, thank you for the invitation to be able to present today. And um, again, my name is Celeste Davis. I am the director of the Environmental Public Health Program at the Northwest Tribal Epicenter in Portland. And um, I just wanted to also say that um, I'm happy to, um, to be here with all of the USET tribes. Um, I had an opportunity a long time ago, back in the day to do a co-step out in the Nashville area. I was based in Atmore, Alabama, and I got to visit several tribes in the region. Um, spent some time in uh, Philadelphia, Mississippi at the Choctaw Hospital. So it's good to be back amongst friends in the Southeast. And uh, let's uh, get started. So um, the purpose of the presentation today and what we're trying to do at the Northwest Tribal Epicenter is to um, provide uh, tools for tribal leaders and decision makers around um, the, consider the public health considerations when um, reopening their businesses and um, resuming operations, just really trying to get the economies going again in the communities. And um, we know that tribal leaders um, will base their decisions on the cultural values and we hope that they will also consider, um, you know, principles do no harm precautionary principles and just really look at the public health framework that is available um, for making these decisions. And we understand that there's a lot of pressures uh, around reopening and um, that it's a balance. That's a balancing act uh, that everyone has to consider. Next slide. So um, the federal government, um, public health experts and Johns Hopkins University provided some um, recommendations that the federal government adopted and, and then these recommendations have been pushed out to the states and so you've, you've probably heard about this phased approach uh, for reopening. Phase one is where we are right now, um, trying to control the spread through strict social and physical distancing and I think um, in many regions of the country um, due to the tremendous work of the healthcare providers, first responders and 
those of us who are just staying home, um, we've done a pretty good job of controlling the spread. Um, and so now um, we're, we're looking to move into the next phase, uh, which is the reopening phase. And I've been hearing a lot of talk recently about um, these principles being gating criteria. So a gating criteria to move into the next phase um, will be where we look at the epidemiology, um, look at our clinics and our healthcare systems to determine that um, we're meeting the criteria and the capabilities. And also we want to consider what the environmental public health risks are um, for specific facilities and business types um, when we're looking to reopen. And you'll see here, we've also got a phase three, which Dr. Mara just talked about. Um, you know, there's a lot of, a lot that we don't know about what the therapeutics will be, and we're far off from the vaccine. And phase four is just a, a distant vision. So uh, <laughs> we'll get there someday. Uh, next slide. So uh, the public health principles that we want to consider for reopening um, in phase two include a downward trajectory of the number of new cases for at least 14 days. These are the recommendations. And we realize that there's not a, there may not be a lot of data to make these um, decisions around these principles too. So this is where your epidemiological expertise that you all have and that we have um, in the Northwest is very important to help you um, understand what that means. What, what does that look like? Um, what does the downward trajectory mean to you? The other consideration is having the rapid diagnostic testing ability so that you can test all those who are ill, um, regardless of you know, the severity of their symptoms. And we also wanna move into, uh, we wanna be able to test close contacts and eventually, if not already, the healthcare workers and all those in essential roles as well. The third uh, criteria is that the healthcare system is capable for caring for all patients and that um, they can do so in, with the appropriate PPE so that the healthcare workers are also protected. And then the fourth one, and this is a, this is a difficult one for us, um, in Indian country um, because we know that we don't have a lot of public health capacity, um, but we do want to build up that capacity so that we can conduct contact tracing. Contact tracing has always been critical in public health and probably will be more so as we move into the reopening phase um, because when we start bringing people together, we're raising the risk of spread, spreading the uh, COVID-19. Um, so we wanna be able to, to do the contact tracing. And then the, the last bullet is an additional bullet that we've um, suggest is that, you know, when you, you've closed the valve, we've done a good job, we've flattened the curve, we want to consider reopening. So we're starting to, to open the valve back up. That means that at some point there's going to be a number of new cases. And, you know, Dr. Mara talked about uh, congregate living facilities, prisons, um, you know, those are, those are um, just petri dishes to begin with. Um, but then, you know, when we bring large groups of people together in some of these businesses, it's the same, the same, um, the transmissibility increases. And so we need to be able to monitor and, and figure out what we're going to do when those things happen. Next slide. And so um, what we are doing with our tribes in the Northwest is reaching out to the tribes to, um, to work with them and conduct environmental public health risk assessments. And you know, a risk assessment is simply a formal process. Um, you can determine your own risk assessment. You can come up with your criteria. We want to evaluate what the risks and hazards um, will be for reopening. So it's, you know, see on the bottom there, it's the likelihood and the consequence of whatever you're, you're looking at um, is, equates to your risk. In this case, we're looking at what's the likelihood or probability of um, transmitting uh, the, the SARS COVID-2 um, or coronavirus 2 or the COVID-19. Um, and then we wanna look at what, what does that mean? Um, what's the severity? What's the impact associated with that? There's health impact, there's potential liability, there's other risks associated with that as well. And so when, you're, when you do these risk assessments, some of the items that you do wanna consider are, 
the contact intensity as a function of the contact type. So we've, we know that uh, the, the distance, so, you know, six feet apart, if you can't maintain that distance, you're, you're increasing the risk. And then the duration of time that you're around people. So the contact intensity is both the distance that you're able to manage and then the time um, associated with the contact. The other consideration would be this just sheer number of contacts. So depending on your business type, and you know, today we've had a few casinos open in the Northwest today, um, those casinos can fit a large number of people in there. Um, and, and other businesses will be able to space out and you know, convenience stores that may have stayed open, they may be able to control that flow of people, but these are the considerations when you're doing your risk assessment. And then um, one, one of the other critical items that you need to consider is what is the modification potential for that business type? So what is the degree to which you can apply physical mitigation measures or uh, um, administrative measures to reduce um, the risk associated with whatever business type or activity that is? Next slide. And so the National Institutes of Occupational Safety and Health um, have a hierarchy of controls that they use when um, looking at risks and health hazards associated with that. And a modified hierarchy of controls can help us um, understand what mitigation measures we might want to put in place when we're reopening. And so these include physical distancing, just like we've been staying at home and trying to maintain the six feet, uh, six feet apart from each other. So this physical distancing is um, something you'll wanna consider as a mitigation measure um, in your facility. There's also additional engineering controls like plexiglass, which I heard someone say the other day, they, they wish they'd invested in plexiglass because it's starting to pop up all over the place. And I agree, that and Zoom. If I had, if I had stock in either one of these, I'd probably be doing well. Um, so you'll, you'll start to see any time that there's a, you can't control the distance, we'll put in an engineering control to, uh, to try and mitigate the, um, the risk of exposure. So you'll see that at a lot of cashiers. Um, who knows um, how these are gonna look. I saw, I saw one today from an Italian firm um, with their concept for air, airline travel and <laughs> plexiglass with people. So we'll see what this looks like. Um, I mentioned administrative controls, which is, um, you know, maybe changing someone's job description, um, using technology, payless technology, using apps and, you know, electronic um, features um, for communication and payment options just to reduce the contact with people. And then PPE, um, unfortunately, for a while, I think we're going to all be living with uh, wearing masks, um, whether it's at work or in public. Um, so, um, both uh, employees and patrons of businesses, I think, will be uh, asked to wear um, at least a paper mask or surgical mask or the cloth mask that you see. And next slide, I think it's the last slide here. So, so in summary, um, uh, what we want as public health providers, the message that we want to send to our tribal leaders is that uh, reopening requires a lot of epidemiological, clinical, and environmental public health risk assessments. We would encourage uh, the businesses to adopt, develop and adopt plans for reopening that include the risk assessments, what controls and mitigation measures they are employing to reduce the risks. And um, we really need to make sure that we're training all employees um, what the new, um, what, what their new business looks like, what this new business model looks like, and they need to really know how to protect themselves. We also wanna encourage you know, a lot of monitoring um, of reopening, um, so ongoing surveillance this, this of cases, and we wanna monitor within the facilities. We also really want to um, establish some kind of periodic evaluation schedule so that we can make sure that the facilities are adhering to the plans they themselves developed. And also, you know, when we come in and evaluate, maybe there are some actions um, or adjustments that need to be made, um, you know, to improve the, the conditions um, 
in the facility. So it's really a, you know, it's a PDSA model for risk assessment, but uh, that is uh, that is what we are suggesting and hoping for. Um, you know, we've got, it's a big social experiment that we've got going on here. So um, we want everyone to be as safe and healthy as possible. And that's, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Celeste. Uh, great presentation. I will hold off on um, questions until the end. Uh, next, we have Dr. Brown, uh, and he's going over laboratory testing for COVID-19. Thank you, Brian. Um, I almost forgot to unmute myself there. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, what I'm going to be talking about, because it's certainly pertinent to our uh, present pandemic, and it's been in the news a lot, and I think there's a lot of confusion around this issue, uh, especially in the lay public, is um, laboratory testing. So uh, could you go to the first slide for that, please? So what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, few minutes is um, 12, a review of uh, sensitivity and specificity. I'm going to briefly talk about what the FDA emergency use authorization actually means. Um, I'm going to talk about the various types of testing, uh, which really right now falls into two part, two different types of testing. One is molecular testing, the other is antibody testing. And then at the end, I'll talk a little bit about what may be coming up very soon on the horizon and just some bottom line, what should we be doing right now about testing? So next slide, please. All right, if, if um, science bores you, this would be a good time to get up and get that last cup of coffee for the day, or maybe you're on your first cup of coffee for the day, um, or do some house cleaning or something like that, because this is a little bit heavy on the statistical science. So sensitivity and specificity are two terms that are thrown out there a lot when it comes to testing, and I think it is um, important that you understand what these things mean. So um, I got this uh, from a colleague, Dr. Tom Weiser, out in the Portland area. Um, this is a two by two table and uh, at the top you can see presence of disease positive or presence of disease negative. In other words, person is sick, person is not sick or infected, not infected. And then on the left hand side there, we have the test results. Is the test positive or is the test negative? So going across on the row, we have people who are true positives. In other words, they are infected and their test result is positive. Then next to that, we have false positives. In other words, people who are not infected, but their test is positive or says they are. So this is a, a false positive. Now, if you look at the lower row, we have uh, those who test negative. So in that first column, um, these are false negatives, people who actually are infected, but their test is negative. So false negatives are, um, you know, that's an important thing. Then going across, you have those who don't have the disease or they're not infected and their test says they're negative. So these are the true negatives. So um, those are the four possibilities. You're either, a, you know, a true positive, a false positive, you're a false negative or a true negative. And if you look down um, the columns, uh, these are all people who are actually infected. So these are composed of the true positive tests and the false negative tests. If you go to the other column where it says, you know, disease negative, these are the people who are not infected. So these are composed of people with a false positive test or a true negative test. That's all really uh, confusing to me <laughs> and has been ever since I was a medical student. I have to review it every time I take boards because it, for whatever reason, it just won't stick in my head. So let's go to the next slide and we'll talk about sensitivity. 
So sensitivity is a measure of a test's ability to detect people who have a disease, all right? And it's defined as the number of true positives divided by the number of true positives plus the false negatives. So if you have a test that has really high sensitivity, that means that you're gonna have very few false negatives. And one, one way to kind of remember this is the uh, mnemonic snout. That is, if you have a very sensitive test and you have a negative result, it pretty much rules out the disease. So in other words, if you could have a test that was 100% sensitive and you had a negative result, that means the person does not have the disease because there are no false negatives if you have a 100% sensitivity. But as sensitivity decreases, in other words, you have more and more false negative results, then um, you know, it's more difficult to say that a negative test rules out the disease. When it comes to um, screening tests, it's very desirable to have a highly sensitive test. In other words, few false negatives. Actually, it's, you know, it's always desirable to have high sensitivity. So let's go to the next slide and talk about specificity. So specificity is, is a measure of a test's ability to find those people who do not have the disease. In other words, you have, it's defined as those with a, a true negative test divided by those with a true negative test plus a false positive test. So it's all the people who don't have the disease including those with a false positive test. That's really, again, I know it's very confusing. So another way to, to sort of look at this is to use the mnemonic SPIN. The, in other words, a highly specific test, if you have a highly specific test, a positive result rules in the disease because there are very few false positives. So if you, if you wanna have a, a, a diagnostic test. You want to have as few false positives as possible. So high specificity is good in diagnostic testing. All right, so that's just a review of uh, sensitivity and specificity, and I'm going to talk more about that when I get to the individual tests. So next slide, please. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's change gears for just a minute and talk about FDA emergency use authorization. What does that actually mean? Well, it is not the same thing as full FDA approval. Usually the FDA approval process, if you want to have a new test and market it, you have to send it to the FDA, usually takes at least a year. Well, this, this epidemic has only been going on now for about four months. None of the tests, absolutely none of the tests have full FDA approval. A lot of tests do have emergency use authorization. Emergency use authorization can only be issued during a declared public health emergency that's been um, put out there by the Secretary of Health and Human Services. It's only valid during the period of emergency. Right now we're still under um, a public health emergency, so if you have a EUA for a test, it's valid for now. But as soon as the, the public health emergency is over, that authorization goes away. So what the FDA does is they do a sort of quick and dirty risk versus benefit analysis to see if the information that the manufacturer has submitted makes it, a, makes it likely that the test is both safe and effective. Um, you know, all of these tests are pretty safe for the patient. They may not be that safe for the uh, person collecting the test or the person running the test, but at least they're safe for patients. Um, but as far as effectiveness, uh, some, of the, some of the information that I've looked at that's been submitted, uh, in my opinion, is, is a little sketchy, but we'll get to that. Um, next slide, please. So let's talk about you know, what tests are out there. Well, basically, they fall into two categories for now. There are nucleic acid amplification tests that 
measure viral DNR, viral RNA, or look for viral RNA. And then there are antibody tests. And Dr. Mira um, talked a, a bit about antibody testing earlier in this presentation. And we'll talk about both of these. So next slide. So molecular testing um, or RNA testing or nucleic acid amplification testing, PCR, um, that's what you hear probably most about is PCR. Basically, all of these things are different names for the same thing. They all do actually technically mean a little bit different things, but basically we can think about all of these as being synonyms for testing for the virus itself. So with these tests, what you're doing is looking for the presence of viral RNA, the genetic material of the virus, because the SARS-CoV-2 virus is an RNA virus. Next slide, please. So just quickly, this is a schematic diagram of what the SARS-CoV-2 virus looks like. Um, it's probably not really what it looks like, but it's a schematic representation of it. It has these spikes on it, which is why it's called a coronavirus. It looks like the corona of the sun. It was not named after the Mexican beer. Um, in the middle of the virus, these actually are some of the largest viruses uh, in nature in terms of how big their um, genetic material is. So in the middle, you see that sort of squiggly thing that's um, the RNA that carries the genetic uh, material for the virus. And there are some other genes, the uh, spike gene, which uh, makes these spikes around the virus. Sorry about the phone ringing. Uh, there's an envelope or e-virus, and there's an N or um, nucleocapsid gene that codes for the uh, nucleocapsid. Next, please. So what is PCR exactly? PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction. It's a process that takes uh, these tiny little uh, genes or nucleic acid and um, makes a lot more of them. It amplifies them so that you can measure the presence of them. So PCR is, is a met method that identifies spe a specific gene or sometimes multiple genes. Uh, reverse transcription PCR is a particular type of PCR that's used for RNA viruses because PCR actually um, measures DNA. So first the virus's RNA has to be converted into a DNA copy and then that's what the machine uh, uses to make lots more copies so that it can read it and say, yes, it's there or no, it's not there. So as you might imagine, PCR requires pretty expensive equipment and a sophisticated laboratory to perform at least most versions of PCR. And it usually takes several hours to do because the machine actually goes through multiple um, thermal cycles. In other words, it has to heat up the sample and cool it back down, sometimes as many as 40 different times in order to make many, many copies of the um, genetic material to read. All right, sorry, this is a little heavy on the science, but um, I just wanted to give you that background. Um, next slide. So what about sensitivity and specificity of PCR? Well, it actually has very good sensitivity and specificity when it's performed correctly. However, in practice, um, sensitivity and specificity requires comparison to a gold standard. But right now, PCR kind of is the gold standard. But we do know that the sensitivity is not 100% because um, it suffers due to either maybe the, the person doesn't have that many viral particles uh, wherever you took the sample from. So um, this is especially true of nasopharyngeal testing if a person's uh, been infected for more than a week to 10 days, the number of 
viral particles in the nasopharynx starts to decrease. The other might be due to poor sampling technique. Maybe the swab didn't go in far enough or didn't stay in long enough. And then the third uh, thing that really affects sensitivity is storage and transportation. Most of these samples have to be stored um, at two to eight degrees centigrade um, for up to 72 hours. After that, they're supposed to be frozen to minus 70 degrees centigrade. And I don't know about you, but my freezer doesn't go that low. So it takes a special um, freezer to preserve the sample. So all of these things can affect the, the actual sensitivity and lead to a high rate of false negative tests. Next slide, please. Now, there are some uh, actually, believe it or not, there are some CLIA-waved molecular tests out there. Currently, there are three of them. Um, and the three that, are, that have an EUA from the FDA are CFIDS Expert Express, the Abbott ID Now, and Mesa Biotech Acula. Um, these are all nucleic acid amplification tests, um, and the principles are basically the same as PCR, but um, they do use uh, a faster uh, technology uh, so that they often only take anywhere from five minutes to an hour to perform. Um, they all claim a high degree of sens to sensitivity and specificity. Uh, and I do not own stock in any of these companies and have absolutely no um, uh, bias one way or another. I will say that the Mesa Acula was the only one of the three when I looked into it that they actually tested for cross-reactivity um, to other coronaviruses. So the other two just basically said, well, the gene we're testing doesn't really match up with genes in the other coronaviruses, so we think it won't cross-react, but they didn't actually test for it. Next slide. I'm gonna talk a little bit about, a little bit more about Abbott ID now, not because um, I'm recommending that over the other two or over any other um, of these molecular tests, but because the Indian Health Service purchased 250 of these machines and sent them out to a lot of uh, IHS sites. I know in the Nashville area, we got 14 of these and uh, these were sent to 14 of our clinics. So this is a rapid um, molecular test that looks for a unique region um, of the uh, RDRP gene. That's the RNA-dependent RNase polymerase gene. It uses an isothermal process that um, has been used in the past for testing for RSV, influenza, and group A strep. So it, it's a technology with a track record for these other um, infections. One thing that may limit this right now is that the uh, test cartridges are in short supply. I think everybody got 48 cartridges and so far, I don't know about the availability of more of these. I know at Cherokee Indian Hospital in Cherokee, North Carolina, where I look or where I work, um, we're still waiting for uh, more of these tests. The sensitivity and specificity is, is really unknown right now. I mean, in their, mar their pre-marketing uh, phase, they did do some validity testing, but it's not really true sensitivity and specificity. So because we don't know the sensitivity, it's not recommended for mass screening at this time. The way we're using it in Cherokee is just for people who are admitted to the hospital, we're testing them because it's a quick test. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, this is Amanda Peterson, one of the lab techs at Cherokee. You can see how small this machine actually is. It's, it's like a about the size of a small toaster. Um, and they keep it under the hood because even though it's a closed system and therefore, you know, infection is supposed to be uh, contained, uh, just out of precaution, they use it inside their laminar flow hood. You get a positive result in as little as five minutes. You get a negative result in about 13 minutes. 
one thing that's been found so far is that they were getting a lot of false negatives until as compared to you know a backup PCR test. So the company is now recommending that the swab should not be placed in saline or viral transport media. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to shift now to antibody testing. So I'm going to give you a 60 second review of immunology, which is about all I know about immunology anyway. This is a schematic picture of a, an antibody. And you can see that there are these light green uh, antigens that the antibody binds to. Um, the body makes antibodies in response to antigens, which can be a virus, a bacteria, an allergen, or a toxin. Um, then antibodies bind to the antigens to assist in an immune response to get rid of infections or to handle um, allergens. Sometimes antibodies confer long-term immunity and sometimes they do not. Next slide, please. So antibody testing, which is also known as an immunoassay or serology testing, it tests for antibodies to the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, they're not all that useful for diagnosing acute infection, although as Dr. Mira pointed out, sometimes uh, there are situations where it could be helpful. In other words, uh, mainly if you have somebody that you highly suspect is, um, you know, they have COVID-19, their molecular test is negative, either the rapid or the send out test. So if you had an antibody test and they were more than say a week or so into the infection, uh, the antibody test might be positive. So that could could help you confirm that the person actually had COVID-19. But antibody testing right now is basically the wild, wild west. Um, the FDA issued um, a statement that said that if you wanted to market an antibody test, they weren't going to object to it. You should do some validity testing and you should include some, you know, disclaimers. And you can look at that on the FDA website, which we'll give you the link to later on. But um, basically, there are right now probably over 100 antibody tests out there. But there are only um, nine tests as of last night that have emergency use authorization. I'm going to talk about those now for just a minute. Um, so what's the utility of antibody testing? Well, if you get a positive result, these tests, for the most part, have very high specificity. So, you know, positive tests means probably they have the infection or had the infection. Uh, we do, we are learning that high titers during an infection correlate with severity. Uh, people with high titers tend to have more severe illness. Um, a negative test, at least with the ones that have um, high sensitivity, probably means that the person was not infected. Um, next slide, please. So as I said, there are nine that currently have emergency use authorization. I'm not going to go through all of these because this is a very busy slide. Um, I've listed here the the company that makes the test, the type of test that it is. Most of these are either lateral flow immunoassays, uh, similar, you're probably used to seeing these with pregnancy tests. There are chemiluminescence immunoassays or there are ELISA tests. Uh, sensitivity and specificity is, is quite, um, there's quite a range. And uh, the thing that I was really interested in is cross-reactivity. Um, go ahead and go to the next, slide two. This has the other five of the nine tests. Um, so many of these were never tested against other human coronaviruses. Some were. Um, some of the ones that were tested against other human coronaviruses uh, had cross-reactivity and some did not. But none of them were tested against a large number of samples with human coronavirus. 
So that is, in my mind at least, one of the biggest questions about the utility of these tests because there are four other human coronaviruses that commonly cause um, respiratory tract infections in humans. So let's go to the last. I, I think we're getting to the end of my talk here. Uh, so what's on the horizon? Well, I think there will be a lot more molecular and serological tests coming out. Um, it's very important, I think, to look at uh, the package insert. Um, but what's really, uh, really going to be the new kid on the block are rapid antigen tests. So these are like the rapid flu tests. They actually test for the presence of viral antigen. Um, and it's a rapid test. So these usually are, you know, the answer comes up in 15 or 20 minutes. Um, there are at least five of these that are currently in development. None have been released in the US to my knowledge. They could be really helpful though, uh, because you could get a rapid answer to um, the question of whether or not the person has COVID-19. Uh, it'll be very interesting to see what their sensitivity and specificity are because a lot of uh, rapid antigen tests for other things like strep throat or influenza don't have great sensitivity and specificity numbers. So, you know, this is sort of an exciting area that, you know, we'll, we'll see. Um, next slide. So just sort of in conclusion, I just wanted to leave you with a few uh, thoughts. It's really important to do the right specimen at the right time. For instance, nasopharyngeal swabs are pretty good in the first week, but uh, after that, they sort of drop off because the virus tends to migrate down into the lower respiratory tract. So after the first week of symptoms, lower respiratory tract uh, specimens tend to be better. Um, not all tests are created equal. And really, this is a sort of buyer beware market. If you're contemplating, you know, spending the money to purchase some of these tests, I'd really encourage you to do your homework, do your research ask an expert. Um, so right now we're doing molecular testing for acute infections. Antibody tests to kind of look backwards to see who, who was infected. So that will be helpful in a public health sense. But there's a lot that's not known. And my biggest question, and the one that I'm really hoping will be answered soon, does a positive antibody test mean that that person is actually immune, can't get, can't get the infection again? You know, does, it, does, uh, um, does antibody confer uh, protective immunity? So uh, that's, that's the end of my piece. Uh, sorry I went so long and sorry it's so heavy on the science, but uh, I thought people might be interested. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, we're gonna open it up for questions right now. Uh, so if you have a question, you can either type it into the chat or you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, can you he hear me? This is Liz. Yes. Um, I have a question. Um, I've heard this on several calls that uh, there are there are machines out there that don't have FDA approval uh, that people are buying. Is that true? Um, I guess I could try to answer that question. Uh, as far as machines like to do molecular PCR testing, I don't think anybody's marketing machines that don't have at least emergency use authorization from the FDA. It's the antibody tests that um, people are marketing that don't have even the emergency use authorization. Yeah, well, that, I have heard that there were tests that people were doing. They were saying they're close to getting it uh, approved or something like that. Right. And I think people have the impression that the emergency authorization is that like can happen in a day. So, and I no. assume it's not 
That, that is definitely not true. The, the FDA, it, it's an abbreviated process from their usual process, but they do actually look at the test, look at the validation data, and um, you know, make some judgment call as to whether or not uh, this test looks like it's reasonably good. Um, do they do all that testing themselves? Is that what happens? I don't know. They do not. They do not. They take the, the company's word for it that they oh. did these tests and that the results are really, you know, a, could a company make up the results? Yes, they could. Should, would they? Well, it wouldn't really be in that company's best interest because if that came out, that company would be, you know, take a really big hit. So it, I don't think anybody's making up the data that they're using, but you really have to read the data very, very carefully. Um, I, in the research that I've done on these antibody tests, uh, they, they are definitely not all created equally. Um, yeah. well, some I, of them are tested on very small numbers of people. Yeah. Some are tested on over a thousand. So, you know, I, t I tend to think the ones that were tested on lots and lots of people are probably, you know, more. Yeah. Well, I'm right now with clients I have, I mean, there's a lot of pressure, not so much for the antibody tests, but a lot of the pressure for the regular COVID uh, tests, positive or negative. And so yeah. there, people are coming at them saying, we've got a machine and it can test too. And, you know, there is, there is a hustle going on. And I just, I thought that was odd because I, you know, with FDA, I assume there's penalties or whatever if you market something without approval, but I don't know. That's why I was wondering what other people were experiencing and what was out there. Cause that seemed, um, bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I can only tell you what I've, I've heard and read, and that is there's a lot of fraud out there right now. You know, people, especially with home testing. Now there, there are some approved home tests now, or, or at least yeah. uh, self testing by patients. Um, but those are few and far between, but there apparently are a lot of people who are marketing home test kits that, are fraudulent. So people really need to be careful of that. Yeah, well, it's the tribes of the health centers that are getting the money to buy these things. And sometimes they're frustrated that they've only gotten two machines and they need more because they can't test everybody. And so then there's pressure to go out and buy your own stuff, you know, whether it's buy your own mask, P PPE equipment, or buy a machine. Um, and so I was telling folks that they had to have that FDA approval. But then I thought, Maybe they don't. Uh, maybe there's, I don't know what the rules are. I mean, I assume FDA would crack down. There'd be some enforcement, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, I personally would not go with any test that does not have at least the emergency use authorization from the FDA. I, mm -hmm. I just, you know, that would have to at least be in place for me. Yeah, I know. Make a decision. Well, anyway, I don't want to take up all the time. <laughs> no, it's Thank a great you. question. Really good question. Are there other questions? For Dr. Brown or Celeste Davis? Okay. Um, please do not forget to fill out the survey uh, that is in the chat. Um, that will be lovely. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. And we anticipate you joining next week as well. Um, I actually have a question oh. just before we go. I yeah. know. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Hi. Um, Dr. Brown had said that the nasopharyngeal swabs were useful. Um, primarily during the first week of infection because the virus is more present and then later migrates. So um, what, is there a test that follows that? Yes, um, yeah, and hello Chief Cook, I, nice to see you again. Um, there, there are lower respiratory tract um, samples that can be done. I mean, this would be done obviously in a hospital or at least a procedure suite uh, with broncho alveolar lavage. Or you can test just 
you know, coughed up sputum. Um, it's recommended that you not do sputum induction because that creates, you know, a highly aerosolized environment where, um, at, you know, it, it'd be very, a very contagious environment. So, but if people can, um, you know, cough up spontaneous sputum, that can be sent off for PCR testing. Um, but yeah, it's bronchoalveolar lavage or PCR testing, or I, I mean uh, sputum testing, with, and both of those are with PCR. Um, the testing up here, we're not, we just got our um, Abbott ID now, and um, I guess they're working on the protocol about how they're going to use it. I'm, I'm just wondering about patients who, you know, are told to stay home unless they're having respiratory difficulty. And, you know, as we learn about how this virus acts and it doesn't act the same with everybody, the, the numbers of possible unfound or undiscovered infections is, it's just, staggering to me if all of that is you know as we learn more that we have we really have no clue um what we're what we're dealing with or the magnitude of it so um and we've also had many um anecdotes about people being super sick like they've never been sick before um even back to november and december but in january and february around here and um, just I'm kind of anxious about um, antibody testing but then we don't know you know how long the antibodies even even last so it's fascinating but it sure is scary That's yeah, it, is, it, it is a fascinating topic and I mean antibody testing we you know that could be easily a one or two hour long talk to, if you really wanted to get into the complexities of it. But um, at least based on the experience with the first SARS mm -hmm. epidemic and with MERS, which are both um, related beta coronaviruses, um, the antibodies do seem to last for a pretty long time, uh, at least up to two or three years. Um, but that's based on those other two viruses and the studies that they did mm -hmm. with those. Um, but yeah, it'll be very interesting to see where this goes when um, there are good, reliable antibody tests that are, you know, relatively inexpensive that can be applied to large populations. But I'm, I'm really anxious to find out, you know, what does it mean to have antibodies? Does that mean that you're immune? and for how long, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, great questions. Great comments too. Any last questions or comments? Okay, please do not forget to uh, fill out the survey that's uh, in the chat box. Uh, it'll help us plan the next call and have a great rest of your Friday and a good weekend. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs>